Hey, Dustin Van Noy here. In this video, we will quickly cover Apache Spark. The goal is to cover why you use Spark and where it fits in the data ecosystem. If you want to just get hands on with Spark, check out one of my next videos on Spark and Databricks. Spark is a distributed framework for data processing. This means that processing is going to happen in parallel and resources are shared among a cluster of computers. While you don't have to run Spark jobs on more than one machine, there are not many production scenarios where you would run on only one machine. So a fundamental question is why would I use Spark? This may not be the question you need to answer. There might be an architect at your company that has already made the decision, but it's still really helpful to know some basic reasons. So why Spark? Well, the big data and cloud movements changed our mindset. We now want tools that scale easily as data size grows. And so when we look at those types of tools, Spark is a leader in data processing that scales across many machines. It can run on Hadoop, and that's really where, where it gained popularity in the first place. But it is faster and easier than MapReduce, which was the initial language of Hadoop. So let's talk a little bit more about how this works and what the benefits are. Let's think about the benefit of parallel processing as if it was a group of people doing the job. Really, it's a group of machines, but it's the same concepts. So the idea is actually very easy to understand. If we had a task such as, let's say, counting the people at a concert, you could have one person, which is the diagram on the left, the traditional way, and that one person could be really good at counting, and if it's a small venue, they could count all the people and everything's just fine. But let's say it's a larger venue, the job would be completed much faster if you have many people counting, and at the end you combine the results of all those people's work to get the final values. Sure, there's a little more organization needed. But if you need to count the attendees at a Beyonce concert, you could just hire a lot of people to do the job instead of having one really good, really fast, well-organized person. And if one of them gets distracted by the music, because obviously Beyonce is gonna take everyone's attention away from counting, then you can send someone else over who's much more focused to do the job and finish that piece of the work. We call this capability of adding more workers to do a bigger job horizontal scaling, because if our data processing system is not powerful enough to do the work, we just keep adding more computers. Distributed computing and parallel processing are not new concepts. Few things in computing are. But what if you had an easy way to tell all the workers what to do without having to micromanage in order to avoid two people counting the same section? That's where new programming models and frameworks have stepped in over the last 10 years and gave us the beloved buzzword big data. Spark is not the only option here, but it has a lot of strengths and is often chosen over the traditional single machine processing options. So let's talk about what is Spark. Spark is a fast and general engine for large scale data processing. Spark uses memory, which provides a lot of performance benefits over MapReduce, which did a lot more write, read and write to disk in the intermediate steps. Often Spark is replacing MapReduce as the Hadoop parallel programming API. So if you're running Hadoop, you have a resource manager called Yarn and Spark can run on there as well as the MapReduce code. And so a lot of people have shifted over to do those types of workloads with Spark, and that's really where it grew in popularity initially. So I just mentioned Yarn. Spark can run on several different resource managers or cluster types, let's say. And so Spark can run on Yarn, which is kind of the, the resource manager that's running within a Hadoop ecosystem. Spark can run on a standalone Spark cluster that does its own management of resources. And Spark can run locally, which means on my laptop, I install Spark and run it. You lose some of those benefits we just talked about, but it's a great way to get development going. It's a good way to get started. And you might have dreams of growing to a large size, but you're not there yet. And you just want to build this in a way that's going to scale as things grow within your company. So we have a few language options for writing Spark code. We have Scala, which is sort of the de facto that you'll find a lot of examples in. Python is also very popular. No shortage of tutorials for PySpark code. Java has some examples out there as well and is certainly powerful enough to do the job. And R is another option that's a little newer to the mix. Now, we also have different libraries, different modules within Spark that we can use and they work a bit differently. Spark Core is kind of the initial way of writing Spark code. And under the, a lot of the same things that Spark Core is doing are going to be done by these other modules that have been added later. Spark SQL is probably a more comfortable, uh, easier to use. It does a bit more op optimizing for you than Spark Core does, but it's a higher level framework. 
streaming is its own module, but there's also this like streaming within Spark SQL. And so we'll look at examples in the future, dig into that more. ML, Spark ML is the machine learning library where you can actually do training, you can run module models that you've, you've built already and do lots of cool machine learning stuff in Spark across a cluster as we talked about earlier. And there's a graph module that also offers some of those more graph relational benefits. Yeah, but what is Spark? That wasn't quite detailed enough. Let's go a little bit deeper without, without going crazy here. So in the day-to-day, -day, we talk about writing Spark code, and we also f refer to running the code on a Spark cluster. And so I've pictured both of those here. So the code is obviously on the left, and that's a look at using the SQL module of Spark. It's a very common module to use, especially in the analytics field that I'm in. And you'll see that we read data, we do some transformations, in this case an alias, we could do some cha changes in data types, we can do some group buys and ordering, and then ultimately we're going to do some sort of actions such as printing the data to screen, which is less common in the real world, or writing the data back to a cloud data store such as Amazon S3 or Azure Data Lake Storage. If you're working in the Hadoop environment, this works very well with HDFS instead of one of those cloud data storage systems. There are plenty of other options, plenty of databases, streaming systems like Kafka that typically run with slightly different code than what I'm showing here, but a lot of the same concepts will apply. If you don't follow all the terms I just use, it is okay. There's plenty of time to build up those concepts after you start learning to write Spark code and run it in a simple Spark environment. We will cover that in other videos, and before long, you will probably be able to critique the code sample I have or complain about you know, AWS versus Azure, all those fun data engineering topics we like to talk about to make ourselves feel smart. So let's talk a little bit about the cluster picture on the right. This is obviously simplified, but it's just trying to drill in the fact that there is a master or controller node. You're going to submit your job to that, and it's going to do a lot of resource management to make your job be distributed across the cluster. And so whether I have two nodes or five nodes or eight nodes, I actually can submit my job and not really know anything about that. And this is one of the powerful things about Spark. If I did change that, if I was getting very detailed into how much memory and how many different executors I wanted to run, I can set those configurations at runtime when I'm kicking off the job, uh, but I don't actually have to set all that. I could let Spark use its defaults and do its thing. And for a lot of use cases, I think you'll find that will be just fine performance for what you're doing. So let's talk about the weaknesses here. If I have four workers or five workers or 100 workers, what's the weakness of this model? Maybe you think the API is complicated. Once you get to use it, I don't think that's really much of a weakness. I think the bigger weakness is that things get complicated. Is managing a Spark cluster harder than managing a single machine that I run Python code on? Hell yes it is. It's a lot more areas where things can go wrong, but there's a lot of ways to try and get around that by using managed services like Databricks, either Azure Databricks or running it on AWS or in the Databricks cloud. There are ways to try to minimize how much complexity hits you. But when you have all these different workers, all these different components working together, you'll also get some error messages that might take a little more time to debug than they would if you're running just on a single node single instance of a Python job. So those are some basic challenges to it. And so if you don't need all that power, if you don't need to handle large scale of data or complex processing, you may not want to invest in a cluster of machines in order to do it. However, the way things are moving, the way data grows, the amount of data you have in your company that could be useful if people knew you were capable of processing it, I bet that's a large number. If you're at a medium sized company, it's probably a higher percentage than if you're at a big company that already knows about these capabilities. But those are the kind of things to think about is that if I get this power, it is going to be more complex. It's going to be harder to dig into errors, but I will be capable of doing things that no one thinks I can do right now. And that's a very powerful thing. So let's talk about the strengths. These are slightly recap, I guess, but one of Spark's strengths is for data pipelines and analytics. And that's how I've come into the picture and used it a lot. So you can use it for batch or for streaming. There are some differences in the reading. There's some differences in the writing. The error messages look a little different, but a lot of the core transformations are exactly the same between structured streaming and uh, Spark SQL batch processing. 
Another benefit is Spark SQL. So you can actually create tables that persist. You can write actual pretty much ANSI SQL code, run it against that Spark SQL layer. And if you are really good with SQL and don't have the time to learn Python and learn the Spark API, it's possible to kind of write that code and, and run it through a notebook or kind of submit it through a Spark API that someone kind of helps with the heavy lifting of the Python or Scala code for you. It is good at machine learning. So whether or not you train your models in Spark is gonna be a decision for you and your data science team, but it has the capabilities there. With a few lines of code, you can start training, start testing, implement some models. And if you're moving to more real-time scoring, then you can use the streaming capabilities of Spark along with a lot of sort of familiar tools for data developers to build your real-time scoring with Spark. It uses memory to speed up processing. We talked about this briefly. If you dig into deeper examples, you'll hear a lot more about this. Basically, if we can use memory instead of writing to disk, things are going to be faster. And there's a large community with many examples and tutorials. A lot of these will be in Scala. A lot of them will be in Python. It'll be harder to find Java examples. And I don't know where to find R examples, but if you're into R, you can probably find that space. So many resources on this. A few that I will leave you with are some talks by people who have worked on Spark uh, from the Databricks blog and an example of some Spark training code that I've developed that will probably evolve over time. Thanks for joining. Hopefully this was helpful. Please follow me. Check out DustinVanoy.com to catch more information and actually get hands-on with Spark.